So yeah, this is John with Massimo who is going to answer all the difficult questions. So we're going to talk about um, turnout and how uh, electoral participation depends on uh, the political institutions and uh, the political system. Um, so um, by political institutions we mean uh, electoral rules, bicameralism, judicial review, federalism, separation of powers, committee chair assignments, and all these institutions determining the power uh, of the majority and the minority, um, and uh, how these affect participation. So the way we want to break this down is um, by having a, uh, how could you break this down? And so we are thinking about a, uh, so it's going to be an election, and an election is going to give a, a, a vote share, a break, imagine two parties, okay? And, um, and this vote share is going to be mapped somehow, according to the, whatever the institutions are, into a share of uh, the power, so, uh, which need not be the same share. Um, you may think of this in two steps, perhaps uh, there's uh, an electoral law, which um, goes um, maps vote shares into uh, seat shares in the parliament, perhaps. And then there's a power sharing law, um, again, depending on the institutions you have, that maps seat shares to power share. And the composed mapping is sort of the, what we're looking at. Okay. Okay. Now, um, most models have looked at um, a plurality or winner take all system in which uh, the vote share to map. Power share mapping looks like this red line here, meaning uh, if you get 49.9% uh, of the vote, you get zero power, and if you get 50.1% of the vote, you get 100% of the power, and uh, you get the same power if you have 70% of the vote, and if you have 50.1% of the vote. So uh, we want to see uh, what happens when you have more power sharing, some something more gradual. So one example would be this straight line, which is a sort of proportional mapping between vote share and power share. And later on, we'll look at more, uh, some things more in between. Okay. But uh, yeah, the benchmark model has always been this uh, winner take all for that. Right? Now, uh, so uh, examples of, uh, of uh, when a minority might count, so this veto power. And uh, so this filibuster threshold, maybe a lot la larger winning margin. So winning margin of 70% rather than 50.1% mean more leadership and more committees matter. And uh, a winner elected with a larger margin with 80% of the vote probably has more more power in some sense, more uh, more credibility than a leader winning with 51% of the vote. And all these examples. Um, Okay, so um, we want to look at this from different points of view, so uh, from different models of turnout that we have out there and that we're basically going to take from, from the shelves. Um, and so how does the map uh, affect turnout decisions by rational voters is going to be the first question. So we're going to look at the standard rational voter model and see how rational voters would react to those two different mappings I showed, the red one and the blue one. Yeah. And uh, maybe then we'll look at it from the point of view of parties and from the point of view of the ethical voter models, which are other models that uh, predict higher turnout than rational voter models. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna so the rational voter models is um, we're gonna look at uh, gonna be based on Bobby Rosenthal standard and uh, voter mobilization model. We're gonna look at. Uh, they're based on Shaka and Nail and then we're going to look at ethical voter models a la uh, Coden Conley and um, Patterson, Person, Lockwood, which you probably all know. Okay. So uh, notice here from the rational voter point of view um, and from the, the, these two different models have very different implications. So imagine you are a voter and, uh, and you are in this um, you, are, you know that the power is going to be shared according to this blue line, then you know your extra vote will contribute a little bit to increase the power of the party you support. Um, and so all, all the time, your vote will have some tiny impact. 
but it will have it all the time. On the contrary, in a majority, your vote will have zero impact. Your extra vote will just most of the time have no impact here, but it will have immense impact only you know, with a very, very small probability. That is the chance that the, the election is very, very close. Okay, so the question is quantitative. Does uh, a small impact all the time or a very large impact almost never, uh, which one of the two is quantitatively larger? And that's going to determine in the end term. So um, when we started this question, we had no idea of the answer. So uh, was it quantitative? So this is one of what we're addressing now. Okay, so the model is uh, it is simple. So um, again, take it from the shelves. And suppose there's voters. It's a pure uh, private value settings. Each voter has an exogenous chance, Q of liking party A, Y minus Q of liking party B. And, uh, and then it'll make a decision whether to vote or abstain for his part. Uh, a B voter, again, same thing. And so um, we will have uh, maybe the following situation. There'll be uh, a voter chooses, uh, so the, the turnout will be the following. Uh, there's um, a chance any voter is uh, up for party A, up to Q, or for party B. And then there's a chance that they will vote, okay? And so Q times alpha is the percentage of, or the turnout for party A. Q, one minus Q times beta is the turnout for party B. And the party that gets the majority is the largest of the two areas, right? And uh, okay, so this is standard. What we, what it's not standard in some sense, and it should be standard, is the. Um, is the voting cost. So m many of these models assume uh, homogeneous voting cost. So everybody has the same voting cost. M people have different preferences, but they have the same voting cost. Let's see what happens when you have uh, more realistically heterogeneous voting cost. So we're gonna assume a continuous distribution. Uh, voters have a voting cost from zero on and according to some distribution. We won't put any assumptions on it now. Uh, just uh, differentiable. And uh, so what is, what is the equilibrium we're looking at? We're looking at uh, a, uh, a cost cutoff equilibrium. So there will be cutoffs for party A, party B, below which voters below this cost will vote for A, voters below this cost will vote for B. And so this will imply, imply according to the CDFs, the turnout alpha, or the, ch the turnout for party A, and the chance that any voter independently for party A will vote for A, call it alpha and the same thing beta for party B. And how is this threshold gonna be determined? It's just you're gonna have to find the, the benefit of voting and I'd wait with the cost and find this uh, guy that's indifferent and the guy below him, the guys below him will vote. And same thing for party B. Turnout, of course, is gonna be a uh, chance that you're like party alpha times that you vote for that, ten ch plus chance that you're for party beta times chance 